good morning everybody i can see still people joining but i want to start by saying hello and welcome to this morning's webinar brought to you by the space looking at the state of the sector i'm linda coburn and i'm the moderator today um and really before we start i just wanted to say how excited i am about this morning and what a fantastic array of speakers we have for you um, I think our next slide will give you a, a flavour of who you're going to hear from this morning. Um, and on, on there, you can see it's great to have all these people with us. And one thing to notice is that um, for, for one of the sessions, for J Jabbar's session, we're going to be immersed in his work, Rich Kids. And so before we go any further, I would really like to encourage you to um, log on to Instagram or if you don't have Instagram already, join Instagram and find the, the, um, the hashtag shopping malls in Tehran, because we're gonna be in, in, involved in a clip of this work. And if you don't have that access, you'll only get half of the experience. So you've got a bit of time to do that but before we go on any further. Okay, and a quick bit of how we use Zoom, three things to, to note. Um, we use chat all the time for um, discussions and questions and technical support. There's also a Q&A function in which you can ask questions directly to the speakers. And the third thing is that we have a live captioner with us today. So if captioning would be useful to you, go to the bottom of the street, this screen and select that option. Okay, thanks. So what's gonna happen today? It's really in two parts. And first off, our development producer, Natalie, is going to be talking about sort of ways of connecting with audiences and then Javad and Roz are going to share their um, work and how they created amazing experiences digitally. And in the second half of our workshop today, our head of audiences, Sarah Fortescue, is going to share some of her thoughts about distributing your work um, digitally. And then we'll hear from Helen and Poppy about Rombo Home Studio and the pay-per-view live stream of Romantics Anonymous that Wise Children did, respectively. And um, before we get into all that, and I do hope you enjoy it, I would like you to hand you over to Fiona Morris, our Chief Executive, for the welcome and introduction. So Fiona, it's over to you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us this morning. And thanks to every all of our participants as well. Um, so I'm going to keep this really short because there are people uh, here who have been doing more stuff and should be talking directly to you. But I guess just by way of, of setting the scene for why we want to do these workshops, and this is the third in a series of lessons from lockdown, is that obviously this has been a pretty extraordinary, wow, it must now be coming up for eight months uh, that none of us could have predicted. Um, even, even the government's chief scientific and medical advisors, I don't think had quite seen this coming in the extent that it's affected us all. And obviously you know, there was a very natural instinct from all sorts of organizations of all scales and sizes and individual artists early on uh, when the lockdown came into place to want to keep talking to audiences and that meant there was a rush to online. Uh, it was a strange time for us as an organisation because we had been spending the previous four years trying to persuade everybody that remote engagement with audiences was a really interesting thing to be able to do and at the minute this happened and we found ourselves saying, please stop, don't do that right now, because obviously that landscape is always overcrowded, very volatile and very hard to get heard in. So we felt early on, just take a beat, think about who you're trying to talk to in this moment, what it is you want to say to them, and really kind of take a moment to think about why they want to hear that from you right now. So we began having those conversations with lots of organisations, and everybody, I think, calmed down a little and began to actually publish content that was more directed towards specific audiences. But it was all about having a dialogue, um, because it felt like suddenly the room had gone or the venues had gone very quiet. I think I think in more recent months what's gone on and I think both Poppy and Helen will talk to this is is a sort of sense of okay if this is going to stay with us in part or in entirety for some of our audiences that, that the only means of communication is going to be online then is there a way of creating a commercial model that works effectively uh, to help support that content appearing 
online. So really today, um, what we're going to be talking to you about is work that we did fairly early on to start talking to people to get a sense of what was working, maybe what audience expectations were about the nature of the work. And Natalie will, will share thoughts around that. And then some thoughts from Sarah about what it is to become an online publisher when that becomes your main means of communicating with audiences. I think what I should put the caveat that I'm going to put there uh, for both of them and for all of us is to say this is incredibly early days. You know, we do not know how much of the audience behavior that has begun to embed over the last seven months will stay with us when we get into next year, where hopefully we move back out into something closer to closer to how we remember life being. Um, but it is interesting. I think things have shifted. I think there are opportunities for organizations to really consider how they have a really democratic offer to audiences, how they look at inclusivity that can be promoted by being online, certainly issues around sustainability. But those are the things that I would really emphasize. This is about thinking about value of having content online, not necessarily about how it makes money. Because the minute you do charge for your services, and Poppy will no doubt speak to this as well, the contributors that you're involving in your digital content need to be acknowledged. And you know, many artists and creatives have been so generous with their time and their contributions to work over the last seven months and not charging or charging very small amounts. But that can cannot be sustainable in the long term. So there are lots of sides to this. We're very early days, but we really hope that what we have to share with you today and hearing from so many wonderful creative artists and organisations will be helpful to all of you. And I'm going to hand back to Linda. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Yeah. And so we're going to start with Natalie. So if we can get Natalie on screen and unmuted. Hello. So at the beginning of lockdown, Natalie, you interviewed people across the sector and built a snapshot of that moment. Um, what Can you tell us what the themes were that came through from that? Yes, yeah, so I spoke to a range of people way back in April across the sector, actors, producers, writers, industry, journalists, PRs, graphic designers, um, to get a sense of what they were experiencing at that time at the very just after lockdown started and gradually over the course of about 20 conversations some key themes emerged. Of course one of the most urgent issues then and now was the question of how to make digital pay and monetizing content online and I know this is something we're going to be speaking to in the second half of the session but other themes included the challenges of creating an atmosphere online the impact of 2020 on the arts talent pipeline and the need to fight for inclusivity of both artists and audience as we go through this very strange period. And what conclusions did you draw about the opportunity to reach out to audiences? Digital has always offered uh, the chance to make your work more inclusive, as Fiona suggested. Um, whether that's people who live locally, who for whatever reason are not willing to come through the threshold of your venue, people on the other side of the world who are a flight away from you, and people who can't attend in person for a host of other reasons, whether that's disability, health issues, caring responsibilities, cost, there's many issues that may mean people don't want to come in person. And that's where digital really does offer an opportunity. Digital means you can reimagine your audience experience. So audience members who don't feel comfortable in traditional art spaces can come to your work on their own terms. It means you can be global in your reach. It means with people, people with health issues or caring responsibilities for whom a 7.30 show is tricky, can time shift and watch your content at a at a point in their day that suits them. And it means that you can think about what to charge or not to encourage people to your content who might be have been barred on grounds of costs. All of that, I should say, is true, was true before coronavirus, but it's even more important now. To speak to Fiona's provocation about value, I think one of the things when we think about digital is how you can make your content even more valuable to your online audiences. That might include asking yourself questions like, what can you offer in terms of signing or captioning or audio description? Do you want to be able to, do you want your audience to be able to watch your work in chapters or chunks if they can't commit to a long form stream in one go? What wraparound material do you want to offer in terms of introductions or interviews with cast and crew or synopses? 
to introduce people to your work and help them to navigate it perhaps for the first time? And what is your online onboarding process for people signing up and coming to your content? And how can you make that as streamlined and welcoming and inclusive as possible? There really is a huge opportunity to reach out to audiences. And that's both the people who you know and love who might not be able to come into your spaces for a while, but also new audiences too. And um, before today, we asked people who are attending to send in their questions. And quite a lot of the responses were about questions about what, what we know about what audiences want and need. Um, what came through from that snapshot that you did back in April and has any of it changed in the subsequent months? So I've just talked about the opportunities that digital offers, um, but one of the recurrent themes of my conversations were the challenges of creating an atmosphere online for your audience. Um, a lot of my conversations in April revolved around the idea that in, in real life, if that's what we can call it, a lot of there's a lot of communal culture by stealth, a show or an exhibition or a gig. Is, is a chance to be with your friends and a crowd of people you don't know. It's a date night, a birthday party, the panto in lieu of the Christmas lunch, and it's getting the kids out of the house on a weekend and to the nice heritage property that you know has good coffee down the road. And obviously in March, that, that all came to a sort of standing total halt. I think as we think about how we can recreate some of the atmosphere, that feeling of communality, that's why so many people come to turn to the arts, especially in difficult times. It's about accepting that some experiences, standing in front of the pyramid stage on Saturday night at Glastonbury, we just can't replicate online. But what we have seen is some really innovative examples of what can work, what can capture that sense of togetherness that the arts brings people. Some organisations have tried to give their work an immersive quality. So, for example, Secret Cinema created Secret Sofa, where an email is sent to, sent to subscribers with costume suggestions, drink and food ideas, music playlists ahead of a synchronised watch at home moment for later, later in the week every week. I know we're hearing from Poppy from Wise Children later, but I believe they offered audiences for Romantics Anonymous online, the chance to buy a special chocolate bar to, to have along with the show, which is of course about chocolate. So those were really nice, really nice ideas. For some organizations, it's about keeping that feeling of liveness and um, giving that the audience that I was there when moment. Andy Serkis live streamed himself reading The Hobbit for 11 hours straight in the spring. <laughs> And when that was over, it was over. So the audience who had watched it, the audience who had watched for 11 hours, really had been part of an experience together. However, as I said earlier, flexibility on timings is something digital offers that really does offer something in terms of access and inclusivity that's worth bearing in mind. And other people have recognised that a lot of what's positive about a positive arts experience is often not what's happening on stage. It's about thinking what's the digital equivalent of going to the bar, having an interesting conversation with the people next to you, even those random and revelatory conversations that we have in the loo, in the queue to the loos on the way to the festival. And one example of is the Hay Festival used the Crowdcast platform and they had a chat that spooled through um, all of their events where people sort of exchanged ideas that was designed to replicate the sort of intellectual buzz of what that festival is like in person. And my colleagues at the space had a really big success with one of our own productions it's it's true it's true it's true and a tweet along at home to make people watch at the same time and exchange their ideas about the show so it doesn't have to be complicated but it's definitely about thinking about ways you can draw people into your event and make them see, make your audience feel seen as part of it mm. thank you thanks natalie and your point about audiences being seen brings us nicely to our first guest who's javad alipur so well Javad's um, arriving. I'll just say a little bit about him and his work. So he's a writer and performer of um, a trio, created a trio of plays about digital technology, resentment and fracturing identity and how those things are changing the world. And the space commissioned a digital version of the first work, Believers Are But Brothers. And the second play, Rich Kids, was due to be performed at Battersea and then COVID struck. So Javad has created a version for digital audiences. Um, hello, hello. So I just wanted to have a, a quote here from you, which I'm playing back to you, Javad, which in which you said, 
In this online version of Rich Kids, we want to find a way to bring a genuine interaction between the digital and the theatrical to bring out the pervasiveness of the original work. So before we get involved in the clip of, from Rich Kids, how did you do that? What did you do? Um, well, uh, you, 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 you spoke um, very like uh, kindly about us and, and said there how over the past couple of years I've been making this trilogy of shows. Uh, the third one doesn't exist yet. And um, uh, one of the, like a lot of people, my company, the, as a joke at the minute, they're not hugely imaginatively named the Javad Alipur company. Um, we are, <clears throat> like a lot of people, we're thinking about how, uh, because we do work that is uh, very participatory as well as work that you know opens in theatres and, and, and work that sits online and so on. So we're thinking at the minute about um, how stuff on our slate can move around and stuff. But in, in any case, those that trilogy of, of, of work, like you were saying, is about the intersection between digital technology and uh, kind of the changes in contemporary politics. <clears throat> and Rich Kids, uh, the show is called Rich Kids, um, A History of Shopping Malls in Tehran. And it's, um, it's, prime, it, it's ostensibly about um, uh, the, how do you say, obnoxious behavior of the children of the dictators of the global south and how, what, what that story has got to tell us about how capitalism is changing, about um, ecological change, about the nature of history and how we try and engage with it as human beings. And we use Instagram as a metaphor for playing around with that in the primarily because the first, uh, because basically the way normal people have um, an in into how Robert Mugabe's son lives or how the kids of the people who run the Islamic Republic of Iran live or um, how, you know, the, um, the red princes of the Chinese Communist Party live <clears throat> is through following them on Instagram. So in the original show, we um, uh, had a, an Instagram account that was kind of live as the show was happening and some stuff sat on there and some stuff would happen on it and so on. And basically, we just sort of found a way to play at um, sort of being on Zoom with people and making that Instagram come alive with them. So in the, uh, there, there, uh, in the kind of uh, live version of this bit of film that you'll see, um, so I'm sure people, uh, if you use Instagram, you'll know that Instagram has a function called Instagram Live, which is a, like Facebook Live or whatever. It, it's the way that you broadcast at the, the time that something's happening. So in the kind of live version of this recording that we made, uh, with Batsy Art Centre and some other partners, this the section that you're going to see would come out as live, so to so to speak. So for me, when I was thinking about well, what does it mean to make digital theatre rather than what does it mean to digitally capture theatre, I was thinking about well, stripping all this other stuff back. What is the theatrical experience for people? And to be honest, we brought this out in something like, I mean, I'm making dates up at this stage. I can't remember. Like it's all you know. What I mean, it's fucking. It's just all very much of a muchness at this stage, isn't it? Like the last eight months or whatever. Um, I, but some, sometime, I'm going to say sometime around May. And I think by that stage, there was a, you know, we'd done stuff that had just sat for people to watch whenever they wanted already. A lot of that stuff had gone around. And I think we were going, it would be nice to do a bit of an event for people that like you have to be there at a certain time. So that felt like part of it. And the other part of it was that when it works live, there is a feeling of that you know you are in two things at once with an audience of people like you can chat and so on on instagram whilst that thing's happening so i'll let, let you guys guys watch and stuff okay so um so we're ready to play so this whole piece is about four minutes you need your phone at the ready and um basically when we when we get it going follow the instructions if you don't have instagram for the second part just you'll just need to have a little rest and wait and see how it goes, but here we go. We're going to use Instagram for a bunch of this show. So if you go back onto Instagram and open our account, which is shopping malls in Tehran and click through onto our profile, you'll see that fundamentally it's like almost anyone else's Instagram profile. At its heart is this grid of images. If you were to click on the first one, you'd be able to scroll down through them. On a normal person's Instagram account, obviously that starts with the photo they've taken most recently and goes further and further down into kind of the rest of time backwards, well, at least until as far as 2011, which is when Instagram was launched. Ours starts with this 
content from the top of the show and goes further and further back into the rest of the stuff we want to tell you. And I think that's the most iconic way that Instagram is used and its most iconic function. That ability it gives you to curate a visual story about yourself and show the world who you are and how you came to be that way. So the final part of Instagram we're going to use is IGTV. So if you're on our profile and you're looking at our grid, just above that grid, there's three icons. So on the left is the grid. So if at any point in the show, you need to navigate your way back to our grid of images, just tap on that icon. And then on the right, if you tap on that, there's pictures that other people have tagged us in. Then in the middle, there's that little TV icon. And here are videos. Now these, when we did the live version of the show, we streamed live videos to your phone, but this is an archive recording. So we recorded live in Edinburgh last year and we put these videos in here. Now there'll be points during the show when we ask you to click on that TV icon to come to our videos. So when you watch these videos, you're watching an older version of us and we're using them to go further back into the past, which is to say, we're using them to tell you older stories. We've used this function, the IGTV function, to go back in time. The show's gonna start now, and it's gonna start there on IGTV on your phone. So stay on IGTV. We're gonna go back to the beginning. Click on the first video, the one titled 1495. Keep your phone in your hand. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Javar, do you want to come back? Yeah, can you see me? Yeah. And Natalie, I'm wondering before we get into questions from the audience, did, Natalie, did you have a question for Javar about that work? Yeah, hi, Javar. Um, I, I'm really interested with, because you've obviously done, obviously this, your shows are sort of, are about the digital world and now you're taking them structurally to being online. But I'm interested in how you've obviously done these shows several times with a live audience and how as, a, as the creative team, you feel about putting them digitally. Do you, find, do you feel you've lost control? Do you feel the creative experience is slightly different when you can't hear the audience's reaction? You know, what is the experience like for you doing it in this way rather than it being, you know, in a closed theatre environment? I mean, I think um, a couple of, couple of things really. I think in the first instance, like, um, you know, I think there is they sort of the, the, the shows sort of are and about are and aren't about digital technology. I think for, um, really what I'd say is I'm um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm most interested in, I think I'm a bit of an amateur anthropologist. So I'm most interested in how people make meaning uh, about, uh, especially about extreme moments of, of change um, and how that meaning making process um, puts us back into, you know, how that, how that, um, how when we do that, how when we do that, things often seem, this really ancient part of us comes out that's about myth and sexuality and resentment and all this kind of business. And um, I think uh, digital technology, it, it gives me two things. First of all, it's the actual way in which I do my research. And second of all, it gives me a dramaturgical metaphor for telling a story of how I did my research and the story that was uncovered. <clears throat> And so actually the way in which we're using digital technology is quite an old school sort of theatery way, which I think has its roots more in that kind of way of using just tech and performance that goes back like through complicity to the living theater and people like that than, than, than necessarily a tradition of like a kind of contemporary digital art. But I think when that, when that comes into, um, I was speaking about this the other day, I think when that comes into the digital space, like, Actually, um, so this, there's this thing, that question of losing control. I think, you know, that, that um, in the first show, Believe is Albert Brothers, that's actually much more a, a matter at hand because that's got a live WhatsApp group that's working. <laughs> um, and I once did that show, you know, we, we told that show all over the world um, and got to see how it works in front of all kinds of different audiences from like, you know, uh, sort of London audiences to international festival audiences to audiences in Oz and the US and whatever. And probably the the... the the biggest losing of control of that interactivity was doing, we did a special week of shows at Stratford Circus for young people in like a, uh, and I did that show to 400 uh, hormone pumped 15 and 16 year olds. And that show largely became about them flirting with each other, to be honest with you, um, uh, you know, because they're 15 and they've been, you know, they've been allowed out of class for 90 minutes or whatever. So, so, um, but I think when we moved online, like, the, the question of experience is really interesting because I think actually um, as theatre makers, I sometimes think of the, the experience I've got as making work for the screen and with sort of screen making people and the experience of a theatre maker. I think especially in contemporary theatre, I think we often think of uh, the material of uh, that we're using to make the work we're making is the material of the, the specificity of experience of the show, hence why I'm using Instagram or WhatsApp or stuff like that to make the points or raise the metaphors I'm making. And so actually like making that kind of work transfer to kind of a digital realm, I think is much, much more, it's much closer to th making theatre than you have, perhaps think it is. Um, especially if you are putting it up at a certain time uh, in a certain way because what you're getting there is that same very strong opt-in that you get in that you get in theatre which I think is the fundamental difference between work which is recorded and sits and work which you know for want of a less uh you know for want of a less cliche way, way of putting it work which is like ticketed at a certain time and you get a drink and you sit down and you watch it whatever that's like that's just got a much stronger opt-in uh, and I think the way that we did Rich Kids had that Whereas the way that we adapted Believers with you guys and the BBC and stuff, that was more that old school screen way, less strong opt-in of people. Thanks. Thanks for your question, Natalie. I wanted to ask the audience whether you, if you have questions for Jabard, just type them into chat or Q&A and we'll, I'll put them to him just now. Um, and also, Jabard, this is a point for a shameless plug, isn't it? You've got the, um, you've got a live stream of the show that people can go to, I think, on the later in the month, isn't it? Oh, Nick, Nick has put it into Nick, chat. Yeah, now. yeah. So here it's my, my colleague, uh, producer, uh, Nick Sweeting. Yeah, we've got um, a bunch of stuff like hopefully Touchwood, inshallah. Do you know what I mean, like we've got the angels on our side. We've got some live shows in a couple of weeks, and we've also got, um, as Nick's put in the chat, uh, various dates on which you can see the uh, this uh, kind of as live digital version of, of Rich Kids. Yeah, so I think we're really interested in that sort of the thing about creating experience, really. And and the, a question for you is whether, you know, do, does it, you're saying that sort of theatre and digital are very close together. Would you ever think about making a piece that was exclusively for a digital audience? Or are you always interested in the people in the theatre and will you continue to be so? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, like what, you know, I was speaking a little bit earlier about saying like a lot of people we're thinking about how, to actually how to produce, you know, produce our work in these in, in 
in this new context. And I think part of that is going, having made two shows where they, they started off in theatres and then became something that was distributed in a different way. I think just one of the things that we're saying now is like, there's no intrinsic reason, whether artistic or, or financial, or you know, kind of producerial or businessy. There's no intrinsic reason that work has to start in a theatre and move online rather than starting online and moving into a theatre. And I think it's just it's all these questions of going, you, you know, it's the the questions we're all thinking about, which is how long will this way of doing things last? Like where are we? Do you know what I mean? What's the what's the next sort of thing series of things that are going to happen and so on? Um, and what's next for you? Where are you taking the um your work from here well we 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 are um uh sorry we've got um uh i've got this annoying thing where because i'm using all uh, like you know flashly using all mac things if i get a text on my phone and it's not turned off you hear it on my computer which is me pretty irritating we yeah we've got um these these couple of different projects that are um in the that, that are still still moving around and like uh so uh, rich kids a, the, the kind of digital interactive version, live version of that will be sort of digitally touring a bunch of places in the UK and, and, and uh, probably some international places as well. Um, and we are also looking at, so, so we're, we're looking at a couple of things. One is how we make, uh, uh, how we make interactive and participatory theatre, which is kind of COVID safe and COVID secure uh, in terms of like um, in, big non-theatre spaces. And also uh, we're working on some new stuff, which we, we, which we'll hopefully announce in about a month or so, um, uh, which will start off online and then perhaps move into theatres. So when you're talking about thinking about making work in a COVID secure way, what, what are your thoughts about that so far? What's kind of in your mind? What's possible? Um, I think uh, what, this, what I mean by work that we can do under COVID-19, well, I mean, look, we, we are lucky enough to be in a position where we are, you know, we, where our, our, our partners, whether they're co-producers or people who want to take the work, um, kind of international. So the first thing to say about that is that, you know, it's, it's a country by country question. Do you know what I mean? Um, we were in uh, Germany doing some like R&D a couple of weeks ago and, uh, you know, to, to speak frankly, that very strongly feels like a place where, where the grown-ups are in charge in perhaps a way that the UK doesn't. Um, and so what feels possible to do there in terms of getting inside a theatre and doing a play feels very different to perhaps the UK or the US or Australia. And so what, what we're thinking of in terms of stuff in our own backyard and whatever is, um, is, is first of all, looking at the way that we tour and trying to find models, you know, this um, the kind of unicorn model of being able to do theatre in a socially distanced way. And for us, we're trapped we, you know that this run of our old show believers are but brothers at home in a couple of weeks is we we are as i say second lockdown notwithstanding touch wood the idea will be that we've got a socially distanced performance there where what makes that kind of work for us is that we're also uh, very late into the night going to be live casting some versions of the show some partners on the, the east coast of the us that kind of makes all that work for us so that's one model another model is uh, in terms of that we do a lot of like kind of participatory stuff as well and in terms of that participatory stuff um there is no reason why kind of the quality of participation of audience has to be a function of how many people get in the same space with each other do you see what i'm driving at so you can work with the kind of work we do with communities that don't usually access the arts that is about a uh, kind of a theatrical experience there's no reason that can't happen in uh over a longer time with more people in a kind of more manageable covid manageable way so these are the kind of two things we're thinking about really Fair. thanks javad um I'm just wondering whether we've got any last questions. Okay, uh, just give me one second and I'll read it to you. A uh, question here that says, really interested in the places where performance starts and your point about being digital being the starting point. It's like a big jolt to some somebody who's very used to sort of physical centered working. I guess it's more of a comment than a question. Yeah. So it's really inspiring the thought. Yeah. yeah. And then, oh yeah, and then she carries on and then she's saying, so can you suggest a way to get started? Yeah, I mean, it's tough, man. I'm not going to, you know, like, I think uh, f for me, I think um, 
we there's there's a bunch of pieces bits and pieces that we're working on and i think as you know sometimes in our sector you know i think there's a couple of things we're not very good at talking about and one is kind of to be honest with your money and the reality of what things cost and and how we personally subsidize things and, and so on and the other is like kind of the toll even in better times the toll on our personal sort of like um you know kind of uh, mental health and spiritual health and stuff of, of doing things and it has been you know i'm lucky enough to have a bunch of projects that we're working on in a time when people have got you know people are really struggling but it's just that it's that it's that difficulty of like sort of remaining excited about what you're doing when the physical reality of what you're doing is in fact sitting at the same desk in front of the same computer like co-writing plays over zoom or whatever but i think it's just it's like everything else like things have got to be like work driven and ideas driven lovely okay thank you so much Deborah. that's fantastic i'm going to move to our next um our next guest now but i know you, you've got to disappear off haven't you shortly yeah. but can you just say to, will you will you be sort of on chat and available if anybody's got questions for you yeah i could be around for the next little bit uh, next thank little you. Bit and you've got to disappear in about in yeah. 10, 10 or 15 minutes so thank, thank you, you so much for your contribution okay, fantastic thank you um and so i want to bring in now ros robbins so Ros is the chief executive of Dance Consortium, and um, I'm going to ask you, Ros, in a second to explain, give us a little bit of flavour of what Dance Consortium, who you are, and what you do. But really, sort of um, linking back to Natalie's earlier point about ex experiences. This is really what we're asking you to do: is to you're going to talk to us about the experience that you created for dancers and audiences around an Alvin Ailey masterclass. Um, do you want, do, would you like to start by just giving us a bit of a sense, who, who are Dance Consortium, how do you work? Yeah, so uh, hello everybody, lovely to be here. Um, the uh, consortium consists of 18 theatres across the UK, they're all large scale theatres, uh, most of them are commercial, and the consortium exists primarily to tour international contemporary dance companies to audiences across the UK. Uh, it was set up 20 years ago, so uh, this year we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. Um, a group of dance loving chief executives got together because they were so frustrated about having to travel to London all the time to see these great dance companies and uh, wanted to bring them to their own theatres to share with their regional audiences. Uh, so they got together and uh, that's how it all started. And now there are theatres, as I say, across the UK, so in Scotland. Wales, uh, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland. We tour two companies a year. The members collaboratively make the decisions in terms of which companies to tour. Uh, and over those 20 years, we've toured 20, so we've done 46 tours, 26 companies, over 700,000 people have seen them. And they've included companies like, as you say, Alvin Ailey, Maidland mm -hmm. Dance Theatre, uh, Trocadero's Monte Carlo, otherwise known as the Troc, uh, most recently Dardan Basila from South Africa. So a real mixture of companies. And in addition, uh, there's a learning and engagement programme. So there's a real commitment to making sure that audiences are genuinely engaged in the work. Um, we work a lot with local youth organisations, community groups, etc., to give that opportunity for participation and we also have a responsibility for building or making a contribution to building the capacity of the dance sector in the UK so a variety of different sort of aims and objectives really. Thank you so last year you uh, were commissioned by the space to live stream a masterclass with the Alvin Ailey company as you talked about so what, what was the thinking about this behind just sort of briefly how did you how did you get how did this come to be? Okay well um Obviously, although we've got theatres around the country, we can't reach all audiences everywhere. So there are parts of the Northwest, for example, like Liverpool, where we don't have a theatre. There's only one theatre that we take work to in the Southwest. We go to the Highlands, but not necessarily the Islands. And so there are parts of the country that we don't reach. Uh, there's also the fact that, you know, some companies, we tour them every four or five years. Uh, so really, it's very hard to build up a loyal audience for any particular company. So we thought about this idea of virtual touring, so actually sharing the work virtually, digitally, uh, across the country and between tours, and thinking about companies that we might like to virtually tour, the one that seemed the most obvious was um, Alvin Ailey American Dance Theatre, so they're one of the biggest African-American companies in the world. The company is enormous, there's over 50 people on the road, 
uh, we bring them every six years or so because they are phenomenally expensive. So we thought, OK, this is this is the company that we'd like to start with. And well, we naively thought what we'll do is we'll just record. They're going to be here in 2016. We'll just record an evening of their work. Uh, we'll film it and we'll distribute it either live or recorded. How naive were we? So obviously we we realised as we started the discussion with the space, we realised quite early on that we would run into all sorts of problems around rights and royalties and the cost of actually technically filming and getting it of good quality, et cetera, et cetera. So we set up a sort of small working group representing representatives from those member theatres, plus the space, plus we started to have those in-depth conversations with Ailey, who were really interested in what we were proposing and very keen to find an appropriate, uh, cheaper way of doing it. And eventually, because we have this commitment to talent development and to audience development, we came up with this idea of a masterclass, a masterclass that would be filmed while the company were in London and uh, distributed live to theatres around the UK and also to an online audience. So that's sort of where, it, where it came from originally. Okay, so um, I think we should have a look at a bit of it and just give people yeah. a, a flavour of, of the masterclass. So um, we'll play, so I think we've, we've got a clip here, it's about a minute long. And off we go. Heel in, heel in, heel in, heel and pump up and four times. Afro beat, uh huh. Whip, two, three, four, and whip. Do whatever you want. Five, six, seven, eight. Got that? <laughs> What's your name? Asha. Asha is giving me swag. Yes. She's giving yeah. me personality. So, so I want us all to kind of go there. Yeah, don't be shy. This is your moment. Here we go. Here Take we a go. moment. Five, Five, six, seven, eight. Eight. So it looks fantastic, but the whole thing's still available on YouTube, isn't it? If anybody it wants is. to go and watch it. Yeah, good. yeah, it is. So, so really you are thinking about three audiences here. This is all about, we're thinking about, you know, the experience you're creating. So the people who joined the rehearsal at Saddle as well as the people who would be in the rehearsals in other venues, and then ultimately your digital social media audience as well. How did you, what, what were the things you thought about in creating an experience that would be really valuable and worthwhile for each of those? Okay, well, we, we broadcast it to, to six of the regional theatres, so six of the members, so Plymouth, Southampton, Norwich, Birmingham, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and they showed it on screens and then they invited local community groups, dance organisations, youth dance companies to actually participate in the room, so that, but watching the screen. And then we have two young dance companies that you've just seen, fantastic from Impact and Artistry Dance Company. They were actually on stage at as well, and then obviously we have the online audience. So the first, the first thing we wanted to think about really was the quality of the company that we were working with. And obviously by, by choosing Ailey, that was you know, the, the sort of priority for us. And, and a company that maybe some people might have heard of because their work is part of the curriculum, you know, but, but they would be uh, a company maybe that people would want to see and that maybe didn't necessarily have, necessarily had access to their work previously. Um, the, the person teaching was really important. So Matthew Rushing, who's the company's um, rehearsal director, we knew because we'd worked with him before in 2016 that he was very empathetic, that he was a great communicator, that he would come over well. And the same with the dancers, you know, who were the dancers that, that could generate a sort of excitement and an atmosphere around what was happening on stage. And I think you've got a flavor of that from that extract. We spent a long time choosing which extract to, uh, for them to perform. So Rennie Harris's Lazarus was a new piece. It's about the life of Ailey growing up uh, in the Southern States in the 1960s, very much about racism and his experience of that. So uh, again, that was important, but when, and it's, uh, um, Rennie's work is also rooted in hip hop. So that, again, that was important. It felt relevant and, and something that that audience might, might be interested in. The length of the class and the, and the structure of it was really important. It's an hour, and because uh, we wanted to make sure that we maintain people's interest. Um, so there's introduction, there's demonstration of the piece, there's the teaching of the piece, and then at the end of it, there's, there was a Q&A session as well, and people were able to send in their questions um, for the company to answer. Um, we 
we also felt it was important to find a host who would, who people maybe knew, who again would would determine the style um, of the piece. And Hakim Onibudu, who was a, a red carpet host, but who'd also presented breaking convention tours, and, and again was very engaging and was very conscious of he wasn't just introducing the companies on stage, but he was also talking to that audience in the theatres and talking to an online audience. Really difficult to find that balance. Um, and then having those young dancers on stage again to give it that, that sense of energy. But I have to say there were real challenges, you know, in doing it. We were we were working with a tight budget, which, which affected the number of cameras that we were able to work with. So we couldn't necessarily get all the views that we needed, particularly for those participants in the region. Um, who in some instances had, had problems in terms of whether the, when the dancers were mirroring, when they weren't mirroring, what angle they were able to pick up on. We had one instance where the dancers were in black shoes performing on a black stage. So that was, you know, they found it really difficult to see the footwork. It was quite fast. You know, the teaching was quite fast. So there were all sorts of things that we learned so much from. We had a really scary moment right at the beginning when a message from YouTube flashed up because we, we broadcast it on Facebook and YouTube going, you've got the rights for this, you've got the rights for the music. That was a bit of a, <gasps> you know, oh my goodness, but um, we did carry on. Um, so yeah, so, you know, the, the, lots of different things that we talked about. The support of the space was, was absolutely fundamental because what we were able to do is work with a really experienced producer, a really experienced, camera crew, uh, Sarah and her team in terms of the marketing and audience development. So we couldn't have done it on our own without that support. And now having learned it, we hope to move on to build on that experience really. Mm. I'll come to that in a minute, sort of thinking about where you're moving on to, but I just wondered whether we've got any questions from the audience. Anybody want to ask Ros? Oh, okay. So this, uh, there's a question about your broad, can your broadcast be shut down? But I think um, one of our team can probably answer that in, in yeah. chat. It's, uh, yeah, well, so I think Sarah was involved morning. in the discussion when it actually happened. We were all side of stage and Sarah was phoning in, giving us advice on it. Yeah, yeah. Be warned, I think. Be warned. Okay. Um, so so uh, somebody's asking, how many, do you know how many people you reached online? Yeah, so the actual the actual live stream on Facebook, 27,000. But I think more significant has been the online edit um, that's available on Facebook and YouTube. So the online edit, uh, 10,600, and then on YouTube, 26,500, which for us, they're fantastic figures, you know, <clears throat> way above what we'd achieve on a normal tour. And and apart from the, the sheer numbers, have you been able to do anything with your knowledge of those those people who came to you? Have you been able to sort of capitalise on it in any way? Yeah, I think that's been one of the most important legacies, really, is our partnerships with those with those community groups and youth organisations that that participated in the theatres. So some of whom they they were known to the theatres already, some of whom they weren't. So that's helped develop those relationships. The two. Um, young dance companies that were on stage, so Artistry and Impact and Hakim, who's the Artistic Director of Impact, those relationships have really developed and moved on. And we're talking about the second phase of what the relationship with Alien now looks like over the next two to three years. And those people are involved in those discussions. And then the relationship with Ailey with the company themselves, I think, you know, it was a pilot for all of us, really. I mean, they were testing us as much as we were testing out our relationship with those audiences. And now, we're working on a sort of two to three year program of work that it consists of a tour, a summer intensive, uh, live um, classes being taught from the states into schools and colleges, master classes, et cetera. And also we're revisiting now that idea of recording work and showing it live or recorded. And, and weirdly, <laughs> Um, in the current context, in the current climate, because obviously the company, Ailey, are affected by not being able to tour, they're being much more flexible about access, cost, royalties, right? So their attitude has completely changed um, and their and what, willingness what? to look at the potential to share work mm -hmm. has really changed. Yeah. That's really interesting. So, so the, an impact for the audience again and more opportunity really for connecting yeah. with them. 
Okay, I was going to bring Natalie back in and ask whether you've got a question for Roz, Natalie. Hi, Roz. Hi, Natalie. I'm really interested to hear you talking about, you know, how, how that project has developed relationships both with the artists and audiences. And I'm interested specifically in the audiences, how you're looking at, you know, building those people that might not be able to come in person to your performances in future, if that's become part of a sort of key strand to your thinking and um, developing that, how you're going to develop that sort of digital focused audience. I mean, we always um, do a lot of digital marketing alongside every tour. And um, we have a company, Hans de Kretzer, that we that we work with who, who enables us to do that. Um, Without doubt, our online audience has increased since the live stream and we've got an additional thousand supporters and followers across the different social media platforms that we that we use. And um, it's been we've only been able to do uh, one and a half tours since the masterclass one one tour with the Costa Danza Carlos Acosta's company got spent halfway through. And we did a tour of Dada Masila, but we've we've definitely seen a younger, more diverse audience coming through YouTube in in particular as a as a consequence of the masterclass and introducing um, people to the to the work of Dance Consortium. So we sort of hope to be able to build on that the digital program that we're discussing with um, the Ailey company now. Um, yeah, so it's because a, a what we find is in the in the theatres, um, it's, it's an older audience. It depends on the companies, but it's an older audience. It's not a particularly diverse audience. So, so this, the, the digital work that we can do, the digital marketing we can do is incredibly important to try and, to try and change those profiles really. Okay, just checking to see if we've got any qu more questions really for Roz. So just so you've spoken a bit about what this means for you. Is there anything else in terms of, you know, this is, you, you did this a year ago, anything else that you've learned that you'd want to share with people really? Well, I, I think um, just just having that sort of evergreen material, just, just having this um, video that we can, we've used it in conferences, we've used it on online platforms, we've, you know, um, we, we keep sharing it with audiences. So we've shared it as part of our 20th anniversary campaign. We shared it on World Dance Day. So it's, you know, we'd like to be able to develop more of those assets really that we can continue to share um, in that way. And I, and I think just that introducing us to different expertise that we can work with, you know, as I say, having that film crew, having Meerkat, production to work alongside us. I mean, I think we'd, we'd look to work with more of those experts again, really, given the resources to be able to do that. I mean, I have to say, it, 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 you know, comparatively, I'm sure with a lot of digital work that happens, it wasn't a particularly expensive exercise. We did have some funding from, from the space, but, uh, you, you know, it wasn't phenomenally expensive. It, it would, would need to spend more in the future if we wanted to develop uh, our expertise and capacity to the extent where we actually filmed a whole production. But, you know, it, it, it wasn't um, a financially, it wasn't too taxing on the company at the time. And I think we'll, and later on, we'll be talking more about the kind of monetized versions and pay-per-view, which will be interesting, won't it? Because you yeah. didn't have no charge for your no. use. No, but we'd certainly look at pay-per-view in the future if we were to distribute a whole program of work, yeah. So, so there's a couple of questions that are not, not directly to you, Ross, but just kind of general conversations, I think. Somebody's asking what platforms are good to use to share work live or pre-recorded. And I think that that might be something that everybody might have a contribute. Different people might have different um, examples and recommendations. So again, I suggest you can, uh, if anybody has any thoughts on that, just stick them in into chat. And also you, the thought that you sparked for me, Ross, was talking about the, the partners you work with. And one of the questions that we were asked in advance was, you know, the sort of intersection between technologies and performance. And again, you know, how you how you go about finding partners. Obviously, you had a space commission, but more broadly, a question to the audience. How have you those of you who have found a technology partner to work with or advise you or support you in some way? How did you go about doing that? And what advice would you give 
to one another? I think that's those are questions that, you know, it, it, it's really helpful to know how other people have done that and supported themselves. So just before we finish this section up, does anybody have any more uh, questions for Ros or bringing back Natalie, really thinking about audience experiences more generally before we finish up? OK. Are we there? OK, then I think we'll finish this first half. I want to say thank you very much to I think Javad may have. Oh, OK, so so there is there's a question about the monetization aspect, but actually we're going to talk about that a lot more in the second part. I'm and Dean, so we'll come to that. So a thank you to Ros, who I think is going to be around for most of the session, but you're going to have to disappear off early. Um, I think Javad has probably already gone because I knew he had to leave early. Um, we've got, as I said, we've got a live caption with us, Wendy, so you can imagine she's been keeping up frantically the whole way along. So um, we're going to take a two minute break just to give Wendy a chance to stretch her fingers out and then we'll come back um, and we'll hear from Sarah, our he head of um, distribution at 11.28. So just a couple of minutes for a bit of a stretch and then we'll be back on. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're ready to move into part two of this webinar, really thinking about distributions and platforms for your content and for performances. And um, I'm going to start by bringing in Sarah. Sarah, and I know Sarah's, uh, are we going to see you, Sarah? Are we going to, we'll give it a go. Yeah, see how well, I might have to um, turn my camera off. Apologies in advance, everyone. I'm having some technical issues with my wi-fi but um so if i disappear you'll still hear me um but yeah i'm just trying to speed things up a bit okay so sarah do you want to kick off by telling us a bit about your role and what you do explain that to people sure um so i am the spaces head of distribution and that basically means distributing work in most contexts so from online across social media platforms but also a bit of TV, cinema, and video on demand services. Um, and recently we've seen a bit of a shift in how people are distributing their work and a lot more kind of pay-per-view and subscription 
models, um, which uh, Poppy and Helen can talk a bit more about. Um, so yeah, hopefully we can cover some, some good stuff. Brilliant. So just sort of broadly, what trends in digital distribution have you seen in the last few months? So the first thing to mention was that um, at the beginning of lockdown, there was obviously a lot more content. Um, and at the beginning, it was really, really positive. You know, people tuned in in their droves. We saw that particularly with the kind of National Theatre big um, every Thursday streams. But then the narrative slightly changed and I think audiences were feeling there was a lot of content, perhaps too much content, um, and it got termed as kind of streaming fatigue. Personally, I think that's probably associated with the fact that um, streaming very suddenly became a replacement for something that we all love and miss, which is live performance. And at the space, we always say, you know, it's not, um, it's not a replacement. It's it's to enable access, whether that is physical, geographical, um, but all of a sudden, you know, this is the only way to access this. And so I think um, the perception of it slightly changed, but hopefully very temporarily. Um, in addition, it became a fairly crowded marketplace. Um, a lot of organizations and artists were putting stuff up, but often with the same messages. So perhaps without that kind of how to create uh, atmosphere that we just heard about. Um, and then most recently, as I mentioned, people are looking more and more to monetize that content. Very unsurprising, you know, people have got bills to pay. These are really challenging times. And um, ultimately this is valuable artistic content. So it's, it's very suddenly the only way that artists and producers can engage with audiences, um, both artistically, but also to, you know, bring in some cash. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think people are starting to look at how to distribute that work natively. So instead of using, you know, social platforms, they're looking to distribute directly from their websites. Um, either to retain control over audience data and signups, or obviously to attract um, funding. And there are different pros and cons to various models, but I think we'll have time to cover some of those. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So when you're working with organisations, what kind of guidance and recommendations have you been giving to them? So for the free to access stuff um, that we focus on, it's really the same principles as it ever was and the idea of partnerships and working together. So this sector, um, as we all know, works very closely together and it's a very collaborative process. I'd say it's fairly unique to this industry. We often don't see that emulated um, in other sectors. Um, but for specific guidance, it's completely unique, which I get can be quite frustrating, but I'd always start by asking certain questions. So what's your audience reach like? Are you looking to distribute directly? Do you have, or do you need a lot of data? Do you need it to be a live stream? Um, because obviously this will increase some production costs, but it's also gonna increase your distribution costs and limit your options so you just need to think really carefully about whether that's something you want to do um do you have a really short window to distribute in or are you open to entering negotiations with other platforms hosting it for a longer time and reaching their audiences uh, is it something that you're looking to do as a one-off to you know kind of plug the gap as a temporary measure or is it part of a much longer term strategy um, can you afford the initial investment in a bigger platform or do you need to opt for a lower risk approach? Um, do you have a generous pool of donors or would you rather play it a little bit safer and put a paywall on it and ensure that people are definitely gonna pay for that content? And tag to that, do you therefore have the rights for monetizing that? Because it's a you know, whole other question. 
So um, I know that can be pretty frustrating, but it's not one size fits all. And I wouldn't pass on any guidance without knowing the details to those questions. Um, and I'm just wondering, I think some of those questions are really, really helpful. I wonder when you're finished, whether you'll put some of them into chat so people might have another chance to think about them. So yes, definitely. OK, um, uh, just there's a, I'm see there's a question coming up. But I just wanted to ask you, so what's going to continue to be important in the future? Um, I'd say exactly the notion of collaboration and working really closely with each other um over the last couple of months i've had some really illuminating and lightning conversations with performers and producers um including obviously uh some of our speakers um and they have just been so open and honest with their sharing and i think we're at a really pivotal point and it's you know quite scary what's going on out there so I think in terms of sharing the information about what's worked what hasn't worked and learning from each other from everything from platform to price point I think we just we have to be really open about our experiences talking about being open about our experiences we're going to um, bring in um, Helen Shute now and Poppy Keeling and who are going to talk about their experiences and really sort of and some of the work that they've done in been doing in pay-per-view and um, subscription models which would be really interesting so can I get um, Poppy and Helen to appear <laughs> hello, hello. And, and Helen we've got Helen hello lovely thank you very much um so I'm going to so we're running this bit as a kind of conversation because so we sort of talk about your two experiences but to set us up I'm going to ask you to introduce up your work and then we'll get to see slash hear a clip from it and I'm going to start with you uh H Helen would can you introduce us to Ron Bear's home studio please yes I can with pleasure um so Romba is a dance company. We're nearly 100 years old. And um, until March this year, our, our core business was touring around the UK and internationally. Um, we launched Romba Home Studio in August of this year. And it is um, exactly what it says on the tin. It's um, a place that we can call our own. It's um, our home, not away from home, but home in, in, a, virtual, in a virtual space where we, we wanted to create a platform for all aspects of our work. And so it's a place where our audiences can find everything from new work that we create to behind the scenes activity. Um, we're, we're looking at how we can introduce our audiences to artists as a, as a touring repertory company. We commission a lot of artists usually to tour work around the country. And this is a place now where we can showcase their work. And um, finally, in talking about the subscription model, it's a place where people can take classes and engage with our work. Thank you very much. And I think um, I'll ask one of our team to put a link into um, chat so everybody can see that and, and go to it if they want to. So we asked you to um, suggest a clip to us yes. and um you suggested a pod podcast clip i thought you would immediately go for something from draw from within but you picked a piece of podcast and yes. before we play it will you tell us why you did that yes so um i think what's exciting for for me as a producer about the home studio is that we're, we're not limited to, to doing only one thing which is touring and, and performing dance and actually um when for a long time, we've, we've been talking about whether whether Rombert's vision is tied only to producing dance or or whether there's there's a, there's a greater purpose. And actually, I think we're very clear at Rombert that our, our core purpose is to be a place where brilliant and daring artists can can show up and, and be supported to to make work that moves the world forward. And, and we do that through dance because we think it's a brilliant way to do it. Um, but there are lots of other ways that, that we, we can achieve that. And so what, what I picked for you guys today, which is probably my favourite part of the home studio at the moment, is um, an extract from Superhumans. And Superhumans is our podcast series 
We invite um, brilliant and daring people who inspire us to share their inspirations, ambitions and beliefs. And, and we do that by asking them to talk to one of our dancers about their experiences where they've had to push themselves or face challenges um, in order to, to move the world forward in the way that they want it to move. Um, and then the, the play on words on superhumans is that, um, that we believe that all superhumans are also superhuman. And it's really nice to hear them talking about their experiences. So um, I've picked an extract of Tandy Newton speaking to Ron Bear dancer, Kim Sojourner. Lovely. So can we play, can we play the, um, that piece now, please? You'd like to hope that an 11 year old doesn't notice these things, but you do switch on. I mean, my niece is 11 now and I know she is in tune, you know, and it's so hard to think that someone so young and innocent has to deal with that. But it happens every day. It's an extra burden. It's like I said, you have to start learning about something just so you can defend yourself from it. Yeah. You don't, white people don't learn about racism, which we uh, we dis discover. I mean, that's been the, one of the most difficult things in this period of Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. is how ignorant, and I don't say that with any kind of malice, but how, how easy it is for a white person just not to have any sense of what being black, what accompanies that. Mm -hmm. Just because you just deal with it, right? You just deal right. or at you, the very I remember, or at the very least, I just don't have any respect for anyone who's gonna be like that. So I don't even mm -hmm. get into it with them. So those people aren't getting a chance to be schooled. Because why yes. I'm not gonna bother schooling you. I don't want to know you. But then when you when you get to that you. point and you do say something, you're perceived as aggressive and it's of course. or why why is everything about race? Yes, because you're talking about something which is just not something that's in the public yeah. discourse. Yeah. It's like you're the only one recognizing it and bringing it up. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So, yeah, that, I mean, that really surprised me, Helen, when you picked that piece because I was thinking it was going to be about dance and obviously they've gone off and that's your point, isn't it? Really, that, that you're making that content available. Uh, absolutely. Um, for me, one of the, the key purposes of the home studio is it isn't a place for people who um, are necessarily dance practitioners or experts in dance. It's about a place to, to meet audiences with content that we think is important and relevant to the work that we do. And I think that the thing that I particularly love about the Superhumans podcast is that dancers often don't have a voice. Um, it's part of our medium that they they perform to music and even though we do have incredible creatives who give them an opportunity to sometimes vocalize or to to share their personalities is a huge part of their work which is about being the the vehicle for whichever choreographer we've invited in to work with them and um, over the last three years at Ron by getting to know the dancers and knowing what incredible voices they do have and the experiences that they've had taking things into their bodies it felt like an it felt like a really brilliant extra opportunity to introduce, to introduce our audiences to, to elements of their personality or experience that they wouldn't necessarily get when they see them performing. So we'll kind of, we'll talk much more about the different kinds of content you have and the fact that you've got this mix there of um, material that's available for free in your subscription model and what, what people are asked to pay for. And one of those is the, the performance of Draw From Within that you streamed recently. And then I also want to bring in Poppy at this point to tell us a bit about um, the, the work that you've done at Wise Children and your uh, streaming of Romantics Anonymous, which was very successful. Um, we're going to see the trailer. And again, will you, will you just tell us, I mean, we've already had a hint that it's about chocolate, but can you tell us a bit about, about the show? Yes. Um, so Wise Children is a theatre company. We are in contrast to Ron Bear's 100 years, we're nearly three years old. Um, so we're, we're, quite, we're quite small and young, but I would say that makes us quite scrappy as well, um, which is probably why we ended up um, taking on this, sort of running headfirst into this project, um, which was to stream the show that we had been doing that had been meant to be touring America when lockdown happened. It was canceled, packed into a, into a truck, stored, 
on in storage all the all the actors went home but it was sort of sitting there ready to go and 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 we just kept thinking about it and we kept thinking about all the theatres it had meant to be playing at it was our it's going to be wise children's first bit of international touring so we had these kind of great dates and relationships with American theatres and we kept thinking about how those were just withering and dying and when were we going to have a chance to come back and breathe life into them and um over the course of the summer we we had experimented very much our, our technical director Simon Baker had been experimenting with um live streaming to Twitch so we also have a we we since we started we've been kind of charting our progress through podcasts which um Emma Rice our artistic director fronts and, and Simon makes for us and he they began experimenting with live streaming making those podcasts video live streaming them to Twitch so he kind of taught himself how to live stream and we sort of realized we had this skill growing within the company and in about I think it might have it was very late July we we just decided that we should just throw all our eggs in one basket and and give it a shot and see if we could get the show back up live stream it and get it out and we did at the very end of September we live streamed it to the internet for a week and it was yeah it was a great success. Mm. Fab so we'll ask you a bit more about that afterwards but um let can we just watch the trailer to get a, a oh. flavour for this show? Some things are too good for words. <laughs> you're swirling and mingling, your senses are tingling. Incomplete, euphoric list. You're desperate to savour each decadent flavour. In buttercup or truffle or kiss. Don't you think it's amazing? How you never quite know With a thing that starts out so sweet and small True, the tiniest flavour Well, it sometimes can grow As you feel all your defences fall I mean, that is something, something Something Lovely, that's beautiful, isn't it? Um, so, so you've you've talked about it being a success. In ha what happened? What was the success? Well, I think there was the sort of three, three. Well, loads of unknowns, but three big unknowns. The first being whether we could pull it off technically. Uh, the second being whether we were going to sell any tickets because we decided that it should. It was it was behind a paywall. It was it was um, tickets were priced at 15 pounds in advance and 20 pounds on the day um, and the third sort of big risk that we took was that we also developed a covid safe plan which meant our company could perform without social distancing so we also didn't really know whether we were going to get that one past public health once we did whether it was going to work and everyone was going to stay healthy um, and and we were successful on all fronts. Uh, the the COVID safe plan worked beautifully, and it actually there was also a point where we were where we were making the plan and putting all the preparations in place that I thought, well, if we pull this off, it's going to feel like we're performing in ICU. It's not even going to be fun. Um, but actually, it was fine. It all it was all you know. Everybody just absolutely loved being back at work. Um, technically, things went fantastically. Partly to do with the partly because of the, the brilliant platform that we worked with. Um, and partly because of just an amazing team who worked around the clock and taught themselves every new skill under the sun. And um, financially, it, it worked really well. We didn't, we, I think we, we've, we've broken even when you take into account a TTR and a bit of fundraising that we did, we didn't break even just on ticket sales, but we, we came pretty close and we sold 11,626 tickets, which of course probably means twice that many people watched it, we, we guess, because most of those tickets won't have been just one person watching Home Alone. Um, so so we we were sort of, yeah, we, we felt like we succeeded on all fronts. Um, I can see Helen nodding away when you sort of talk about the numbers of people. And it's definitely, it's one of the questions we've been asked is how many people will be willing to pay for this? And um, Helen, what, what, was, what, were you, what was resonating with you? You were nodding, thinking about numbers of people and audience success 
Um, yeah, I think I started nodding on the COVID safe plan. <laughs> but um, no, and I'm nodding. I'm really impressed with, um, I mean, I think maybe for people who don't know, we, we did this project in the same week. And when we saw Wise Children announce, I think we were about uh, 24 hours behind behind you in terms of our announcement. And it was the um, most reassuring thing in the world to see that another organization thought that it would be it would be a good idea to to try something like this during the, during this time we, we had smaller audience numbers but still for us we were we were we were very pleased with them we 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 think again we think probably two people watching so we sold about five thousand tickets um and again we we expect that that would mean maybe twice as many people watching um our our aims were slightly different from the outset um we our first and foremost um was around audience data so we were um selling our tickets with venue partners but to watch our production you had to log into the Romba home studio and set up an account and enter into your ticket number which meant that um everyone who who bought a ticket um is now registered with Romba. so we we start to build um an audience database which is something um after 100 years of of touring as as i talked about we had absolutely no idea who our audience was and this was um becoming actually an existential problem for the company. When, when I joined in 2017, um, we, we could see that audience um, figures were dwindling in some parts of the country. Um, we, we could tell that our audience wasn't diverse and we, we knew that it was um, an older audience, but we, had, um, but we had no direct relationship or contact with our audiences. And so um, our, our aim around the home studio was not a, a COVID response, actually. We'd, we'd been talking for a long time about trying to create a platform where we could build a direct audience with our relation, with direct relationship with our audiences so that we could introduce them to our brand as we saw it, not through the medium of a theatre where we all, there's always a barrier between us and the and the, the people who come to see the work and then also hope to to grow and diversify our audience because we start to know who we're talking to we can talk to them directly we can really show them who we are and um when you come back to 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 the podcast it's absolutely for us about building a fan base we actually talk about fans not not just audiences people who really who really love what we do where the work resonates with them that they that we build a strong enough and warm enough relationship so at the point where we we make an offering whether it's online or hopefully one day back in theaters as well people are are driven to come come and see us so audience data was a big thing for us and um like poppy i was um really worried about audience relationships we had um gone under a huge period of change at Romba over the past two and a half years up to the up to the pandemic and we had um, invested a lot in new programming and particularly building international relationships we had um an international tour that started in february and was scheduled to go for just over a year we had another production um that was going to be touring sporadically internationally and in the uk and um our third company was in the middle east doing a collaboration with local artists there um all of which sort of ground to a halt and my my big worry was that we would lose those we would lose momentum we would lose those relationships and so um again thinking about future business model um ticket sales has never been um a a huge part of Rombert's picture and it's definitely something that we wanted to grow and improve but co-production and working in partnership with venues was becoming a really significant part of the way that we were making work and so um, the reason one of the reasons we we chose to sell tickets with venues was because we wanted to access their audience data because we had none of our own and, and reach out to audiences but the other thing was we were testing whether it would work for venues in a way that they might be willing to start to co-produce work in the future so that rather than than simply being the distributor they would actually become producers producers in the work as well thank you um poppy this the sort of question of the relationships with venues is interesting because you took a different approach didn't you really in terms of or, or you have a slightly different relationship yes so we um one of the reasons that we sold so many tickets was that we worked with 34 theatres around the world who helped us in, in much the same way that Helen's describing, who helped us promote and, and sell tickets to the show. Um, and I should also back Helen up there that, that the idea of being able to talk directly to our audiences was 
dramatic you know it's a it's a real change for a touring theatre company um so so yeah we teamed up with 34 theatres mostly in the UK but in other parts of the world all those theatres that we weren't able to play to in America and they promoted tickets to their audiences and and it was an it was a lovely thing to do um you know it was it was successful but it also felt like we all had something to work together on again and and there was there, I don't know it, it was it was really energizing and galvanizing and you know some of the theatres had furloughed all their staff and couldn't do very much and we got you know an e-shot and a few tweets out of them some of them were so energized and delighted that they did loads and loads and it sort of didn't really matter it was kind of up to them and we tried to make sure that all those theatres were really prominent in the in the marketing and the publicity we made little films we dedicated a night to each to sort of different regions of the world so each live stream was sort of notionally directed at a different part of the world um which actually was sort of I'd, I'm not quite sure we'd do that again but it was kind of a nice idea um and so and then we made films with each of the theatres and they were featured in the interval um and that's really one of the reasons that we had such a such a big reach we, we couldn't have done that on our own mm, absolutely um I'm just checking to see whether, whether we've got any questions that kind of really thinking about that sort of you know your approach and thinking about selling the, the tickets okay um and so somebody's asking how did the box office split work if you if I don't know if you're willing to answer that yeah yeah so so for us each of those each of those participating theatres got 20% of the sales that were attributable to them and their channels and we could track those as they came through into the back end of our ticket platform um, and somebody's asked what what the platform was and it was they're called ticket co and they I, I would highly highly recommend them it's a pay-per-view um streaming and integrated box office platform who we've really enjoyed working with I mean, we, um, we worked with a small, smaller number of theatres we worked with with 12 theatres also internationally and and also trying to respond to time zones so one of our streams um, went out at 1 a.m uk time from the building which again I, I, it was wonderful and we had um audiences in new york and and um, and chile particularly but obviously across that region of watching and, and it, there was something really magical and fantastic about it um not sure how often we want to do that but it was it was brilliant to do um, we we went for um, a split in favour of the venues, so we offered them a 60-40 split, mindful of the fact that we were coming to them very late, and as Poppy said, with um, venues who had um, most of their staff on furlough in the UK, and so what we were trying to do is incentivise them to at least be able to rate, create enough income to cover the cost of bringing people back off off um, off a furlough to to do the work, and um, and obviously. We, we were thanked for that for that split. And I think we'll probably have to carry on with something similar. Mm -hmm. can, can I ask a question, which is, um, it's, it's really for your opinion, but not expecting to be experts in this, but people, uh, one of the questions is saying, you know, you're quite large organizations, would this work finance wise for smaller, for the smaller organizations who make up the majority of the landscape? Do, who, do either of you have a feeling about that? Could it work on for smaller, scale organizations i think um that it's true we, we are a large organization and at this production um draw from within was heavily subsidized as it would have been if we were touring it in the uk um and the the change to our business model as i was saying in recent years was the international work which um, over time, touring internationally starts to to pay back the cost of making a production, and the and the um, the way that we we break even on a production is now through co-production. I think if you had a really brilliant idea and you could get venues to to contribute to the making of the work, then you then you could have a viable business model, and that's certainly what I'm going to be experimenting with on the next broadcast that we'll be doing. But the the model that we did, where you you share a box office sixty forty. Um, and and we took on the cost of the work. Is that you would absolutely need need subsidy for, for that. Thank you, Poppy. Did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I I think I sus I mean, yes, relatively we are both big organisations. I suspect, although I don't really know that that we're probably all, you, you could also say that we're on two different levels of big organisation. Um, and I I think that there is a there's a live stream or or, or on demand. 
um, digital distribution model for every level. I think it's about working out what you can afford and then then tailoring your making your decisions based on that. Um, so lots of choice as to as to platform, as to how you stream or how you film. You know, those are all decisions that can be made at different levels. One thing that was really key, and I think we did this, we did it on a shoestring, the, the technical side of things. One, one of the experiments for us was how cheap is a terrible word, but how, how slimline can we make the actual filming and streaming of the show? So my previous experiences working on live streamed or capture projects are that the, the, the capture element of it, the streaming element of it, usually adds upwards of £150,000 to the to the production costs that's the kind of level that I've worked on digital projects at before on Romantics Anonymous our capture and stream only costs so the additional costs above the cost of making the show were 15,000 so that I think that's really really small um, and we were we, and the, the way we did that was we just sort of did everything in-house um, we our Emma was our camera director, our stage managers operated the, the cameras, um, our sound designer was our vision mixer. Uh, so that kind of thing. It was, it was a real, um, do they, is, it, is that called a cottage affair? I don't know, it was a family affair. Yeah. Um, and Helen, anything else from you on that? No, I think I would say, I mean, again, um, I think I think Poppy's right. I think we're mindful of the fact that we're in we're all in different situations at the moment. And whilst um, the, the crisis has hit us really hard and we definitely weren't throwing money around, I think that one of the um, drivers for Benoit, our artistic director and myself, when we when we decided to to turn what was going to be the draw from within was going to premiere in the same week that it broadcast at the Norwich Theatre Royal. So we we made the same decision, which was rather than scrapping this production, we would make it in a different way. And actually one of our drivers was that we had enough resource to do this production and creating work for as many people as possible actually felt like a really another really good benefit so we worked with um a fantastic broadcast producer Derek Richards and he really is fantastic but he's also on this <laughs> on this call so I'll make sure I heavily sing his praises and he may want to jump in but we we worked with him to to look at how we could do it cost efficiently but but not trying to bring our in-house team to do things that they hadn't done before but actually employing freelancers to do that work with us and we are very aware of how lucky we were to be able to do that. So, so we're talking here about two different with the, with the with the the pay per view live streams. We're talking about one work with draw from within, sort of created for um, this this context, and Romantics Anonymous is a, a, a reinventing, a restaging of a work that you already had. What about and you've you've sort of hinted at kind of COVID safe working and all of that. I'll start with Poppy, but just really thinking about. What was different in the in the making of it? You know, you you're sort of already starting to think. Tell us a bit about this. What? How was it? In what ways was this different to how you would make it your normal the theatrical performance? Well, aside from the COVID stuff, not not a huge amount because we, you know, we really wanted to. Well, we did it very very quickly. We had a, a week long rehearsal period, and then we were straight into into the shows and we had to keep it short for money and for covid and um so we knew we couldn't change much about the show but we did slightly redirect it towards the cameras and and you know there were so so emma's work for anyone that's seen it is it very very the the audience is very much part of it and and the the performers talk to the audience and um their complicity is is important and we decided early on that we didn't want there to be an audience in the, you know, even a small socially distanced audience. We were going to do it just for camera. And that was a decision we made because partly for expediency, but, but also partly because we felt that often in a capture or a live stream, the digital, the at home audience can feel like they're a witness to the real event rather than being the real intended audience. And we wanted to, to make our at-home audience be the real intended audience. So we there were a few bits that, that Emma kind of redirected so that instead of speaking to an audience member, the actor would be speaking straight down the camera. Um, but but we didn't change much else. And, and, and Helen, how is it cre creating something purely for digital? Um, 
Yes, I mean, again, we, we were in the opposite situation. We hadn't had a day of rehearsal um, on, the, on the new production at the point where we decided to, to make it a broadcast. And Benoit, our artistic director, was, um, was very clear that if we were going to do this, that the, the point would be to make something that we couldn't possibly make if we were going to do it on stage. And so he wanted to give the audience an experience that they, they couldn't have. Um, again, we sort of set apart from the COVID stuff, but I've, for me, this was the first time I've, I've worked on, a, on a, a project like this for, for screen. So for me, COVID is now completely intrinsically built into what I, I think of in terms of creating, um, creating the work because we, we worked across different studios and the, the dancers could see what was happening in the different studios thanks to Zoom, Zoom link ups. Um, which became part of the process, which became part of the work that, that, that you saw at the end. But um, I think that the key thing for, for, for us working with Vin van der Kabus, who's a choreographer who's worked a huge amount in film, was about the relationship with the camera for the dancers. And so this idea of the camera being a, an active participant in the production, they had them path mapped out, the dancers were choreographed in and around the camera, the camera was choreographed in and around the, the dancers was, was something that was, was talked about a lot in terms of the making. Um, the other thing for us, because we were broadcasting from home, and again, that was a really strong message for us at the time, which was that we're not going on tour, we're staying at home, and, and we were inviting people into our home. So it was the use of the different parts of the building and um, being able to to see things that you wouldn't see in terms of the intimacy between the dancers, which you don't get if you're sitting in a large auditorium. Um, at one point we did talk about being able to see elements of what was happening sort of off camera. So not, not trying to be too perfect about entrances and exits, but actually I think that the whole operation got incredibly slick to, <laughs> by, the, by the end. It was, um, it was um, you, you, you really had an experience as a, as a, as a viewer that was, that was made perfectly for, for the screen. Mm, lovely. And um, there's, we've had another question, which is not about Door From Within, it's about your the um, online classes that you run. So this is all part of, you know, just saying with the, with the home studio, you've got all this different content in there. And somebody's asking whether the subscription model for your for the classes that you run through home studio, whether that's been successful. Um, it, it's growing, which I think is, is the sign that we wanted. So um, we, again, we, we ran, we've always run classes and courses at, from our home at Rombert and it had been a long time that we were discussing the fact that our classes were always oversubscribed and they could only ever happen in one location, which was our building and um, we have a national remit and um, international ambition and we felt that it, for, for a long time we've been talking about whether there was a way we could try to make our classes program more available to, to a broader audience and so obviously we'd started by looking at that doing that live and having having teachers around the country and um actually it came very personally from me a while ago because I'm, I'm i'm a single mum and i do all of my um exercise online and have done for years because it's cheaper than paying a babysitter and going going to the gym or, or going to a yoga class and so i was quite obsessed with these yoga apps where you could log in and do and do classes and had, we'd been talking about whether we could start to offer some ballet bar or or um, improvisation classes and so when and we hadn't done it because we're busy and like all arts organizations you have more ideas than you could do and then when when um COVID hit and we had to shut down our classes very suddenly we did what a lot of people did and just flip them all onto our YouTube channel and um we were doing pay what you can and um we, we were generating income and we were getting more participants that we would ever be able to get into a studio and so as we were developing the idea for the home studio it felt really obvious that we should we should move the classes onto that platform um and and see if we could charge but we've started with a very small subscription so it's five pound it was five pounds for your first month and it's 7.99 a month so that's that's less than we would charge for one class normally in, in person and we're doing that because um we also feel that although we're extremely established in our field on the one hand we're also novices in this field and we want to to reflect the fact that this is new this is new for us and um, we don't want to overcharge and alienate audiences again coming back to the core purpose of the home studio is to build really strong and positive relationships with people um, we've got 12% of our members who are the people who've joined the home studio choosing to subscribe and uh, we have a really fantastic and engaged digital advisory group 
who work across the tech sector. And all of them are telling me that this is a really, really significant and positive percentage. Um, and that percentage is holding. So it peaked at 15%, it dropped down to 12% because I think a lot of people joined the home studio to watch specifically watch draw from the, draw, draw from within but um apparently anything above 10 percent of people choosing to take a subscription model is a really is a really positive sign so at the moment it's not generating enough money to cover it wouldn't be enough generating enough money to cover the classes but what we're doing at the moment and this is where similar to poppy we're using our in-house skills all of the romba dancers are teaching the classes so at the moment, we don't have a, a huge additional teaching cost as things get busier and we, we talk about returning to normal. We're actually, I've said to you before, Linda, we're not going to go back to normal. But as we get into, as we get into a, a fuller programme for, for the dancers, that will become less possible. And we're hoping that we'll have reached a tipping point whereby the class subscriptions will be covering at least the cost of the teachers and then, um, and then starting to generate income. But again, acknowledging our different position, we are heavily subsidized to, to deliver a significant amount of public benefit. And so I'm very comfortable with the idea that whilst we have that subsidy and have access to it, it's, it's a good use of it to make these classes available. Thank you, thank you. And Poppy, when we were speaking, you were saying, you know, because you're so new, the whole idea of a subscription model um, was a was a non-starter. And so you've, you went down the, the kind of, just doing a, a, sim, a single um, production. And um, what what have you learned from that? What will you, what will you move forward and do next? Yeah, I mean, I, we I'm not sure we really even properly considered a subscription model. We've got um, very little content really. We've made three shows so far, and one of them was we made we filmed with the space and was on the iPlayer for much of lockdown. So we so we kind of felt like we didn't have all that much more in the bank to offer. Um, but having said that, we are planning to, I, 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 can't, I can't give the details of it yet, but we are planning to do another one. And we have, we have thought of one, something else that we have in the bank. Um, and we are planning to sort of build on all our learning and, and do another live stream quite in, in quite a similar way um, as quite soon. And when you're saying you'll do it in quite a similar way, is there anything that you think, oh, we've got to do, we've got to remember that that worked really well, or oh, we must remember that that didn't work well at all? Yeah, so so one of the changes that we're going to make is that we didn't make the, the streams available, uh, they were live or nothing, um, except for the fact that we released an audio described and a captioned version in the week after. So we couldn't do audio description and captioning live, but we were able to make recordings of the films with those access versions available and lots and lots and lots of people bought uh, the caption show on demand and watched it in the week after the streams and we felt sort of it's only anecdotal but but from things we picked up online we felt that quite a lot of people were were buying the captioned version because they hadn't been able to watch one of the live streams and they wanted it on demand and certainly our American partners told us that they thought they would have sold m many more tickets if we had made the film available on demand. So this time round, we are going to do a week of live streams and then the, the, uh, the best recording will be available in the following week on demand. Obviously that changes the right situation. So um, I'm not sure we would have been able to do that with Romantics. I can't, I, I can't actually think off the top of my head, but we will set this one up so the rights are in place to do a video on demand week because we think that will will boost sales and i think i said earlier that i wouldn't um i, I wouldn't necessarily work i wouldn't necessarily do the regional um positioning again i didn't mean that we wouldn't work with lots of theaters around the country again that was that was fantastic although it was a huge amount of work um what I meant was we had sort of designated the Tuesday night show as the Scotland and the North of England night and the Wednesday night show as the Midlands night. And it was kind of great because it, it, it felt like each of those theatres had a chance to really invest and get behind one of the shows. And we were able to talk to audiences in those part of the countries. Emma did an intro and she sort of addressed those audiences. But it was just a gimmick because, of course, you could actually watch any of the shows from anywhere in the world. And I think we slightly tied ourselves up in knots around the messaging of it. We, we sort of made a bit of a confusing message in doing that. And I think we probably wouldn't do that again. We'd work with all the partners, but we, you know, acknowledge the fact that it's on the Internet. You can watch it from anywhere. <laughs> 
wholeheartedly we did exactly the same thing and we were just having a nightmare of how do we talk about what time the show is on on our channels because as you said the venues could pick which show they wanted to promote and really make a thing around it but we were trying to talk to all our audiences simultaneously and trying to explain that it's on at 8 p.m in the states but not the uk tonight with we got ourselves completely tangled yeah. up as well. And, and yeah. half, our, half our theatres as well said, well, why would we only sell one night when there are five nights? What's the point in that? So, I, yeah, I think, I think we, it was a nice idea, but it was a particularly sensible business idea. Like, we gave it a go. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it funny? It's like, a, sort of, you know, your automatic assumptions about what, how things are going to work are being you have to start questioning them all, don't you? And think, actually, is there, there's a, this is digital and it's a different way of doing things. That's interesting. I'm going to bring um, Sarah and Fiona back in. I'm wondering, Sarah and Fiona uh, and Natalie, if, if any of you have any questions you'd like to put to Poppy and Helen at this point. Um, oh, that's thrown me slightly. Is I it? think okay. we've covered... Well, uh, there are plenty more. I just wanted to give you the opportunity if any of you have a question. We've covered a lot. I guess to get into a bit of the nitty gritty because I know so many are currently exploring this, you know, these models for themselves. And it's, um, you know, there are loads of different options out there. And I would be interested in hearing about whether you explored other options and platforms, you know, before you got to... To this model because there you know there are so many options out there and obviously it's brilliant that you both found ones that work for your individual needs but um was there like a lot of research before you got to those two should we start with helen sure um yes and a little bit no because um, there, there had to be an element of moving quickly and, and responding to what was in front of us. So, so the yes part is that we knew what we wanted to achieve and that ruled out lots and lots of options for us very, very quickly, which was around um, this notion of building, building a home for our work. Now, we'd already started to talk about making draw from within a digital project at the same time we were talking about accelerating our plans to have an application where people could take classes and, and we hadn't necessarily thought about them being one in one the same because we weren't expecting theatres to shut left, right and centre all around us in, in the way that they did. Um, once we knew that we were going ahead with the Ron Bear Home Studio, it was absolutely obvious to us that we needed to site draw from within inside the platform to make to make sense of, of our, entire, our overall strategy. Um, so I think, so yes, in the sense that um, we had a clear pathway and we knew why some platforms wouldn't, wouldn't work for us, but no, in the sense we just simply didn't have time to, to talk to lots and lots of different people about, about how, how we might make the platform work. Um, and, um, and we were still learning on the job. I mean, again, you know, Derek, Derek's a great person to chat to. He's on the school. We, you know, on the on the night we had a problem, and we did have one huge problem. We had to cancel a show. Um, and we immediately everyone told me about fifteen different ways we could have done the show, which which might have prevented it. But um, I would say that talking about learning experiences and going back to if you're doing something and you know why you're doing it. Um, and I, I, I spoke to Linda about this um, when we were we were preparing to to do this webinar. It was actually it's probably the best thing that could have um, demonstrated to me that we were doing this for the right reasons because um, I've been in theatres where I've had to cancel shows before, and it's and it's awful and it's often to do with injury when you work in dance and um and the worst thing is that you don't as i've said we don't have a direct relationship with our audiences so we just have to rely on the venue to email people i mean if it happens on the night when you have a safety curtain that won't open or something you have that awful bit of going to stand in front of people and tell them but but you can't have a conversation with those audience members and what was incredible for us on the friday night when um our server crashed um was that we could actually contact every single ticket holder directly ourselves with a message that we wanted to give them and talk to them about what had happened and we could let them know what we were going to do about it and as a result you know every show that i've been involved with it hasn't happened over the the years that I've been working in theatre, the, the following week has been sending apologies to people who've 
written saying, you know, I couldn't come and you don't know what they were told and you don't know, sometimes they didn't even understand the reason that the show didn't happen. And in this case, we've had nothing but warmth and support, people tuning in. I think it's also learning that online audiences are very different because most people said, no worries, watch it tomorrow, um, which they did. Um, and we grew our audience as a result of all the Twitter conversation about this show that wasn't happening. But but mainly I was just struck by the, the way we were able to maintain the audience relationship and that. So again, coming back to if you know what you're trying to achieve, I think the right platform jumps out quite easily, actually. Thank you, Helen. Poppy, what about your choices and decisions? How did you decide which way to go? We did do a fair bit of research and I actually didn't do it myself. Um, so I'm not probably not the authority on that. But again, it was a sort of series of questions of working out what we wanted to achieve, what the kind of um, you know, what the negotiable bits of that were and what things were set in stone. And then and then you could start to narrow down what was possible. So the big one was we knew we wanted to charge. So YouTube, Facebook, they weren't going to work. Um, we looked at Vimeo and we couldn't afford it. Um, so, so, you know, we, once, once we knew what we needed, we then looked at what, what prices different people were charging. Um, what else? made us decide I can't think it was just sort of a process of working out what we needed to achieve and then what what platform would help us do that the other thing you said to me was that that that, just, that you had really really wanted people to be able to watch it on the telly yes yeah so it was really important to us that it could be a proper something that you could have on your tv on your smart tv it didn't have to just be on your browser um because we felt that if we were asking people to pay for it it needed to feel like a film or, or a real piece of piece of content not not I don't know why but but it felt important and one of the things that Ticket Co offered is a uh, it's it's got an app that you can put on easily use on a smart tv and certainly that the feedback that we got that was that it was really easy for people to use. Thank you thank you very much. Um, do Natalie or Fiona do either of you have a question we've got some questions about rights which I'm going to try and summarize and come back because we don't want to go into that in too much detail but is there anything else Fiona you look like you're yeah hi hi both um i guess the big thing i wanted to say was what what do you think because you both referenced poppy that you decided to do this as the kind of cottage industry use the use the core team to help deliver this and helen you made the very good point about kind of actually the creative industries as a whole with you trying to hang together here and we've got a lot of freelancers out there suffering um in many different areas but i'm quite interested just around the skills the upskilling what what you would both say you've learned from this initial uh, adventure in terms of what you would want to be able to have as skills within your core teams going forward i don't know which one of you'd like to go first um i can try i think we're still i mean we're, we're still learning i mean for for Romba now if we if we move forward with with what I mean I don't really want to call it a hybrid model but I think we won't go back from broadcasting now I think that that's now going to be built into our our plans going forward we we love it because of the creative possibilities we also love it because it answers a massive question we had about the environmental impact of dashing around for one show here and there internationally um and so um as, I, as I've, I've referenced Derek a couple of times. So we, we brought in Derek as a broadcast producer to, to work with our producing team. And that was, that was um, not, I mean, not just essential, that was, it, it changed, it completely transformed the project from the, from the second that we had someone from the very beginning of the process talking to us about how to create the work. We certainly could have brought people in later on to help us stream it, but then we would have created a very different work. And I think we would have, we would have discovered a lot less of the potential. So I think starting early and having people involved in the very beginning of the planning was really important um, in a time where, you know, like all organizations, we've had to make unbelievably difficult decisions over, over the summer. Um, I was definitely focused on, on making sure that we leave space in our team for people who understand um, online content. And so we now have a platform platforms manager who looks across all of our platforms and understands how they all link in and a partnerships manager um, these were jobs that were repurposed inside the organization so partnerships isn't just looking at um, sort of 
I don't know what you'd call them, or the old fashioned traditional notion of partnership sponsorship or um, collaboration, but really looking at how we start to look at distribution models, how we start to look at working to make sure that we reach wider audiences with our work. And, um, and we now have a, we've created a role of digital content creator inside our inside our artistic team. So we have the sort of permanent ability to, to create work on a smaller scale in, in that medium. Um, but, you know, I've said it a few times and, you know, whilst it's, it's really, it's really tough in the larger organizations, we are painfully aware that there are organizations who are in a much, much harder situation. So I have also been quite focused on trying to spread what we have as, as thinly as possible without, without compromising any ability to do their job. Um, um, Poppy, what, what have the learnings been for you? Well, I mean, I, like Helen, we imagine that broadcast will be part of our our regular programme of work going forwards. I mean, you know, the, the dream is that we get back to touring, but we are also able to to keep this model involved. Um, I mean, I think I think our ability to have done this project is really down to the fact that we had a technical we have a technical director as part of the core team who both wanted to and was able to basically teach himself to become, I mean, I think broadcast producer is probably what Simon was, you know, that, that would have been his title on, on the show had, had we known it. Um, and I do think that part of our success was about the fact, and it's quite similar to what you're saying, Helen, that you had Derek on board right from the start. So in, in a similar way, I think both of us are probably talking about the idea that the, the digital is really kind of embedded in the organization. It's not the organization coming up with a project and then kind of bringing in skills on an ad hoc basis. It's about having those skills embedded right from the start, whether they're a core member of the team or a freelancer that you bring on board very, very early in the process and really let that person listen to the kind of artistic um, expressions that are that you know what's what's being asked by the artistic director what's being needed by the producer and, and the, the sort of business side and then can digest all that and work out what what your digital way forward is so I, I, I mean I guess that more and more organizations will be trying to kind of embed that kind of role in within their organization at some level sooner rather than later and I, I think that that was what, what our success is down to. I think um, on Draw From Within specifically, um, not necessarily in relation to the whole home studio, there's another key role that, that I haven't mentioned, which was the cinematographer, Emma, who was also involved very, very early on in the process. And our choreographer, Vim, was, was um, rightly um, aware of the importance of her role in the production and so rather than the choreographer making every single decision about what's going to happen and, and you, you have this other creative collaborator who's going to be heavily involved in in looking at what the audience is is going to have access to and where and 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 what views they're going to see and how they're going to experience them and um and so that i think if you're thinking about creating work that that role of um cinematographer or i think it sometimes gets called something else director of photography is is in, is incredibly important and we we couldn't have made this production without emma and i'm sure vim would say the same thank you so i'm noticing we've just got a couple of minutes left so that that's a, i think this is the place to kind of wrap up but i just wanted to ask all of you panelists really we we had a question about you know what what where should we be going in future what should we be thinking about in terms of moving forward what what do you think are the big considerations for arts organisations um, in, in this space in the coming months and years? That's a very general question, I know, but we just uh, we've got two minutes left. I just wonder if anybody had any thoughts about what either what's most important for them as an organisation or what you think you would like to be seeing more of. Anybody like to wave if you have a if you have a thought on that? I'm happy to say I'm happy to say what's driving me at the moment. If that if that's cool, and I think it's. Um, it's um, being very um, careful not to put um, rose colored glasses on when I look back on where, where we were and it, what's happened has been catastrophic and terrifying and emotional. And it, it's, um, you know, there is no doubt that we've lost a huge amount in the last period, but there was lots that was wrong with the system and the model that we were operating on. I talked a little bit about um, where we were at with audiences um, we were we were we were failing in some aspects of our of our work and fighting very hard to change that. And so I think that for me it's this 
it's fighting that tension between desperately wanting to return to something that I know how to do and that my team know how to do and the familiarity of the of what we 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 were sort of superficially winning at and that that idea of normal and actually being really open to the fact that um with all the um the really genuinely terrible things that have happened um, to individuals and organizations over the past six months, that there is an opportunity to come back better and to come back with, with a different approach to, to problems. And I've mentioned the environment and I've talked about diversity of audiences. I obviously chose that, that clip um, between Tandy and Kim very specifically. You know, the, the 2020 has been more about more than just the pandemic. At, at Rombert and I think that that's if you look at us going into 21 it will be about trying to take those things forward in a new way. Thank you, thank you very much we've literally seconds left would anybody like to add anything to that or does it feel like we come, so we've come to a good end so um, that's it I want to thank our panel so much for all their time and sharing and also to you the audience for engaging um, involving yourselves, um, asking questions and answering each other's questions. Um, and just to say with there's, uh, as you leave, there's an evaluation form, please fill it in. It's really helpful to us in understanding how we can do more, uh, more webinars and make them better. So thank you to everybody for all your input. And uh, that, uh, with that, I'll formally draw it to a close. Goodbye. <laughs>